part of Double P Media, doublepmedia.com. Welcome back to Bustin' Blockbusters. My name is Matt Murdick. I am joined by Priscilla of Priscilla TV on YouTube. Be sure to check out her YouTube channel as well. Today, we are covering Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, Season 1, Episode 7, The Eye, which was written by Jason Cahill and directed by Charlotte Brandstrom. And I want to just bring this up right off the bat, Priscilla. Why the heck are we calling this episode the eye? I know mm. we open on Galadriel's eye. I know Muriel's eye is, well, her eyesight yeah. is taken away from her. Mm-hmm. But I always associated with the the eye with like the eye of Sauron. Uh, and in any time I read um, Tolkien mm-hmm. or even watched Peter Jackson's film. So why are we calling it the eye? I don't get it. I don't have an idea. So. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, I, I just think it's because of, uh, you know, Galadriel's, um, like the first scene. And then they say, okay, let's call it the eye. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a good idea. Let's call it the eye. And people are going to wonder if this eye of Sauron and no, but it's just Galadriel's eye. I have yeah. no idea. The eye opens. Uh, if it if it is just added one extra word for context, because if yeah. you have the eye opens, then we know it's about uh, referring to Galadriel. If it's the eye mm-hmm. closes, then you know it's about Muriel. Speaking of which, I do want to bring this up right off the bat. So I thought a couple of weeks ago when Muriel's father made that prophecy about darkness, I was worried that it meant she was going to die. But evidently, mm-hmm. it just means this, that she's going to go blind. So, yeah. Uh, my bad for for taking things to too much of an extreme. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, that's what mm-hmm. I typically do anyway. So let's get to our ratings because uh, people want to hear those and then they can throw them out the window and, and tell us their own uh, ratings simply by tweeting mm-hmm. to at bus blockbuster or you can send emails to matt's audio blog at gmail.com or you can leave comments at the website matt's blog.com or you can of course leave comments on our youtube channel which is actually double p media's youtube channel we would love to hear from you there we did hear from a couple people in the past couple weeks i'm trying to catch that up and uh, this week as well so uh priscilla Give me mm. your rating for this episode, season one, episode seven, The Eye. Okay, so my rating for uh, The Eye is 9.1 double Cs. Uh, sure. Wait, wait, double Cs? Yeah, calamitous consequences. You know, this episode was all about uh, you figuring out what your actions, like the consequences of your actions and like facing these consequences and maybe uh, moving towards another uh, path, maybe uh, sticking to where your guts are are leading you. So um, we see the aftermath of the volcano explosion, eruption, better saying eruption. And uh, it starts on, uh, on this note and uh, we pass through a lot of people. We go back to the Harfoot plots and also uh, Aaron and Durin. But there is this uh, overarching, overarching theme that in this episode that people have not only to face the consequences of their actions, but also rethink what they do now so you have a turning point for many of the characters specifically Galadriel she seems to um have been uh, I'm not I'm not going to say that she regrets what she's done because she was uh proved right like the the threat was there and she has been telling everybody since the first episode Uh, but uh perhaps her methods were not the best how to fight it 
and she had to uh you know to come down a little bit to uh, reevaluate what she was doing in her life and also Muriel uh, she also had this moment where she figured out no it's better to remain in this path like we already started this so we were going to be- go back to Numenor and continue and during also the same thing Nori the same thing so um I thought it was a very visually compelling episode for a series that's already visually compelling. No, but this was striking. Uh, filled with emotion, no, but perhaps it's not as a uh, well-rounded episode as the previous one was. Like the previous one, you, you, you didn't need to take or leave any scene out of order. Like it was really, it had to be that way for you to understand this one, I think. It's not about something is missing, uh, but um, there was something there in this episode that um, it didn't reach uh, as high a note as in the last one, for me at least. Okay. I I would tend to agree with that simply because um, I found, I did find myself in emotional pitches with this particular episode, especially uh-huh. during certain scenes. Although I think I can probably contribute that more to Bear McCreary's score than I can to the story itself, because Mm -hmm. his score was fantastic this particular episode. I am going to give this an episode rating of 9.2, just slightly better than yours, out of 10, what I like to call triple Bs. Triple Bs? Yeah, triple Bs is Bad Breath Bell Rocks. Oh my God! Yeah. It's his breath is so bad that uh, the leaf, he doesn't even have to blow a flame on the leaf itself. He just breathes mm-hmm. outside and growls a little bit, and the leaf just combusts. That's bad breath, if you ask me. Uh, it certainly wasn't my favorite episode either, Priscilla. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did feel like that it put a lot of pieces in place. These these penultimate episodes typically do this, where they. Mm-hmm. take all the characters and they put them in certain positions for the finale mm-hmm. and uh this achieved that fairly well uh plus we did get some great character moments as, as you mentioned mm-hmm. uh in terms of people facing their own consequences and what have you and and just moments between characters as well so i the, the big takeaway for me here is uh, there's got to already be a shipper name for for Durin and Elrond out there because that friendship is the one relationship in this story that it's I just constant, truly do yeah. a, yeah. enjoy. So do we want to call this relationship Durand or do we want to call it Elrin? But I mean, uh, Giza is, she's okay with it. So I think it's not a, a like a two-way relationship. I think it's a three-way relationship. So Okay, so... Deezer and Rond. Um, <laughs> Elren, Elreniza. Elreniza. That's amazing. Yeah. Elreniza. There it is, relationship, yeah. folks. Uh, Elreniza. We've got a three way going. Uh, nothing wrong with that in the dwarf mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, I've been watching too much House of the Dragon where it's like, oh, everybody can just screw everybody. I have something to say about it, like, because I I happen to, you know, figure I have to surf the winter web. I don't know if you heard about it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm online sometimes. And like I visit some sites to read some reviews and the... The review for the Lord of the Rings was getting late, so I read the one for the House of the Dragon this time around. I'm sorry, but you're watching a telenovela. I'm very sorry for you. Like this is not. I I don't know. I I, I think George R. R. Martin is like fooling you all. It's a telenovela. I mean, there is a guy who faked his own death to travel. This is like. Typical telenovela, Brazilian telenovela. Yeah. Add that, add to that sex. We have a lot of sex in our telenovelas. You have adultery, you have murder in telenovelas in Brazil. It's it. That's why it's so uh it's it's been so successful in Brazil right now, House of the Dragon. Oh. Because it's 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 a telenovela with dragons. It's like the best of two worlds. They keep saying, Oh, it's fantasy for those who don't like fantasy. Yeah. 
this is a telenovela that you're watching. The people are messy, people are terrible. Yeah, that's exactly what my people like. Well, I should tell you that if you are going to ever happen across another review again, you should check out our friends at Double PHQ. Uh, ah, that's their yeah. handle on Twitter, uh, the Joffrey of Podcasts. They'll give it to you straight. Uh, and uh, that's <laughs> Bubba and Catfish. They will tell mm -hmm. you the straight up truth about how none of these characters measure up to the greatest character that ever lived, and that's Joffrey Baratheon. And yeah. ever the greatest character that was ever created, for that matter. But if you want to catch up with their podcast, <laughs> be sure to look up the Joffrey of Podcasts on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. You can also catch it right here on this Double P Media YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe by going to youtube.com slash C slash the word double, the letter P, the word media, or you can contact them via Twitter, the word double, the letters P H Q. That's for pod has podcast headquarters. You can also go to facebook.com slash the word double, the letters P H Q, or you can check out their website, the word double, the letter P, the word media.com. We always like to plug the bosses. Uh, because yeah. it is Bubba's Millions that funds this video that pays Priscilla's tremendous salary that she demands for making a, a <laughs> dual appearance. She's appearing three times a weekend on podcasts and, and YouTube videos and with Sam. Universal 42, yeah. well, her own channel, Priscilla TV, and here as well. So uh, I know that you're making the big bucks just like Bubba is who recently uh, just bought a second mansion from what I understand and went on a galaxy adventure, uh, Star Wars galaxy adventure cruise, which are quite pricey. Um, but, you know, evidently he's making so much money, not necessarily off of our videos, but off of his own success with the Joffrey of podcasts that uh, him and Catfish can afford to just be complete bums and, and do nothing else and just live in their mansions. But the thing is, you know, like they, they are, he was traveling and then he released our own podcast very late later on. And like we had some complaints, you know, yes. this one it's about funny. it. So I, I think that Bubba knows those people personally that did complain. It, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> like, so I think the, the millionaires like traveling, they they should have like, I don't know, organized themselves better. Yeah, I think so part of that whole galaxy adventure thing, the reason why he didn't have because he, he travels a lot on the weekends, but normally uh -huh. he had does have access to the Internet. But because he was involved in that Star Wars galaxy thing, um, I don't know if I don't think they take away your phones, but I think that they do oh. keep from, from uh, pushing anything out there on the Internet. And so he didn't Against have any way to do it. Uh, yeah, I understand. Like we 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 forgive them. It's yeah, okay. this time. This time only, but they only have one other episode after this one to uh, to to worry about us. Uh, anyway, I'm a, I'm already depressed to be honest. Uh, I'm having such a good time with the show, like being Middle Earth again. Yeah, that not only I'm depressed that it's ending, but um, that we might wait two more years for the second season. So uh. yeah. You know, they, they, they started filming now, right? Yeah, last week. Yeah. yeah so it it should, yeah. Even even best case scenario, it'll probably be another year and a half. It'll yeah. be interesting because I think uh, uh the other show that that Jeffrey podcast covers, uh, they mm -hmm. also won't be starting filming until March of what? next year so it'll be like what is happening yeah i think uh i think that the reason is is hbo is going for trying to get a uh, house of the dragon back into a spring release schedule oh okay uh just like the way that game of thrones was most of the time mm -hmm. so i i figure that's why they're doing that but as far as lord of the rings go you know I, I I guess it's just uh, wait until bezos actually puts money in the account before you can do anything probably uh, not like he doesn't have a whole bunch of it. At any rate, uh, we should just transition seamlessly into yeah. the music segment from there, as in get out of here with that Bezos talk uh, and talk about uh, Bear McCreary instead. And finally, this week, and, and please forgive my voice during this section that's coming up. I pre recorded it. It's about 10 minutes long. So if you're not into the music, uh, or anything about that, then you can skip ahead 10 minutes and you'll be safe. But 
I also know that uh, the actual recording took about 11 minutes uh, for me to record. And I had to speed my voice up because I've been sick this week and I sounded so tired that I sped my voice up uh, by about six or seven percent, uh, just so it wouldn't sound like I was falling asleep in the middle of my own talk. Anyway, here we're going to talk about two themes that we haven't really talked about too much before uh, Elrond's theme and the theme for the stranger. So today we're going to be talking about two themes that have actually been here throughout the entirety of the series so far, but I don't think we've talked too much about them. And in this particular episode, The Eye, interestingly enough, they both appeared, and interestingly enough, they both have a melody note that holds that we call a major seventh, because that's the distance of where that note sits from the root of that chord the bass note of that chord, and both were played in 3-4 in this particular episode. Both are usually played in 3-4. So there's harmonic implication, there's rhythmic implication, and of course the way that it is produced timbrally, the instruments that produce these sounds that we call music, also can have a great effect on the psychological effect that the music has on us pertaining to a particular scene. We call that psychoacoustics. The first theme that I want to discuss is the one for The Stranger. We've heard this theme so many times when Nori is with The Stranger throughout the course of the series so far. The theme was stated once when Sadak was sending The Stranger away and then had a much more dramatic turn to it when Nori offered him the apple as he was going away. A very sentimental moment, and I want to explain how the music helped contribute to that. But first, let's just look at the theme itself. A very important part of this theme that makes us wonder about the stranger's ability to do magic is a line that is produced either with harps or some kind of bell-like instrument, both which timbrally we've kind of learned to be associated with magic all the way back to a long time before music could be recorded. If you think of Tchaikovsky's Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies, there's bell sounds making that dun 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 Well, of course, fairies are magical, and of course, that particular sound helps contribute to the lexicon of us associating bell sounds with being magic. Even when they're played in lower octaves, like was utilized in this episode, as Sadak was telling the stranger to, you know, there's tall folk over there. Maybe they'll help you with your stars. Just don't be here anymore. But the way that the harmony also works is that this arpeggiates, or meaning it outlines the chord without playing the notes at the same time, two minor chords that are not typically related in the same key. And that's what kind of gives it that weird magic, that sound that we're kind of like, oh, is this good or bad? We're not sure. Both of the chords are minor, so we should think darker or more serious. Yet the way that these two keys do not connect as the line flows through makes us think, well, I just don't understand. Because the outline of these two chords aren't supposed to fit together, yet it's not really uncomfortable because one seemingly kind of leads to the other, but it does produce this feeling of uncertainty, but not necessarily scary. I'm talking about this. As I mentioned, we have major seventh harmonies also going on in both of these themes. And in this particular stranger theme, it is placed over a minor chord, which is also kind of rare. You need to go through several different kind of modes to get this. Modes are the way that scales are broken up into individual pieces between individual notes of the scale. It's a lot of jargon, I know. You don't really need to understand it. All you need to do is understand how it sounds. But it happens in the first statement of the melody when the melody jumps up. And it is a big leap because this melodic shape is pretty dramatic, which helps also to add to the enigma of it. But when you place everything together, 
with the arpeggiation, again the chord outline underneath, you start to get this sound. doesn't really sound malevolent, right? But at the same time, it does seem kind of mysterious. And part of that is created in the way that this melody, this major seventh note in the first part of the melody, instantly puts you in a place where, well, those things aren't supposed to go together, but yet they do. They feel like they need to lead somewhere. And then you get the new harmony, which says, well, that's not where I thought it was supposed to go. So it helps build the mystery, just like we don't understand who this stranger is. We think he's good, but it seems like every time he does good things, bad things also happen. And that's Bear's intent here, is to create an ambiguous theme, really, in a way. One that feels magical, but also doesn't define to us as good or bad, because too many major chords would make us think, oh, he's a good guy. Too many minor chords might make us think, oh, he's a bad guy. We just don't know yet. But the kicker was the way that the harmony changed from the second minor chord in the sequence where Nori gave the stranger the apple, we did throw out the second minor chord and instead went with the major chord. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the first chord in this theme will resolve to the relative major much easier than it will resolve to the minor. And that's why her giving the apple to the stranger demanded there be some kind of change in harmony because otherwise it's still ambiguous and here we don't want ambiguity here we want it to be known that these two creatures beings have feelings for each other they have a friendship and friendship is supposed to be powerful and lighter we generally don't go around saying i want to get rid of my friend i mean sometimes we get mad at people and we say that i guess but you typically don't banish your friends. Usually friendship is a happier state of mind to be in. And so we get a major chord. We get a resolution like this. So that's the exploration of one theme. Now let's turn to another theme. One that has also been around all season, but we've done very little, if any, commenting on. And that's a theme for Elrond. Particularly in this episode, we heard this theme twice. We heard it once in its kind of usual state of harmony when Elrond was being told by Durin that Daddy wasn't going to let him have the Mithril. We heard it a second time as Elrond was being banished and pushed outside. It was being played as he was sitting on that rock. And the two different harmonizations of those Different chords were applied underneath the same melody, and it created different feelings for each of those scenes. The first one, we get this very sentimental thing because Elrond is obviously forgiving Durin. It's not Durin's fault that his father has said no, and their friendship endures, and so you get this kind of sentimental feeling out of that. The second time around, different chords are applied underneath to make everything seem darker. It implies more of a minor thing, although this theme itself also has major and minor implications, lighter and darker implications between different phrases. And I believe what that represents is the fact that Elrond is a half-elf. Part of him is what the elves would be considered to be great light. Part of him is not, which the elves kind of shun. And so those are lighter and darker feelings towards Elrond, and thus we have a theme that reflects those lighter and darker feelings that Elrond may even have about himself sometimes. And I'm not going to really break it down like I did the prior theme, but I just wanted you to hear it so that you'll be sure to recognize it the next time that you do hear it. And again, all of these themes are present in Bear's many, many released soundtrack recordings for this series. He's done a really good job of putting out music that's specific to the episode. But we'll get back to Priscilla and begin the episode recap after I play for this theme for you. Be sure to listen to it. The second chord is the one where the melody ends up having the major seventh in it, which feels much more harmonious, you'll notice, than the major seventh in the Stranger theme. Anyway, that's all I've got. Back with Priscilla right after I play this for you.
All right, Priscilla, are you ready to talk about this episode in recap form? I was born ready. You are born ready. That is for sure. Always born ready. <laughs> Galadriel, Theo, Muriel, the queen, and Isildur mm-hmm. and Valandil all survive mostly intact. Mm-hmm. Uh, those circumstances change a little bit, but we got to pour one out for Antemo. He had decided to stay behind with the village. Well, now he's literally staying behind with the village because he gone. He dead. Yeah, but we knew that he would die because he has a fiance back home. So we knew. Yeah, exactly. he's the one with a, a personal life. So of course he would die. <laughs> that is true. I didn't even think about it in that way, but you are absolutely <laughs> correct. He's he's decided he wants to stay there uh, and leave his fiance behind. And what do you get for that? For those kind of dark thoughts where you want to check out the village for a while and you don't want to go kill orcs, you get death, my friend. Yeah. Anyway, Sildor and the Queen, uh, they hear people struggling in a burning building. They do manage to get the victims out, but then the building collapses uh, and it seems like some of the sparks get into Muriel's eyes, blinding her at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. You see her then kneeling with Valandil standing over, but the building completely collapses on Isildur. And that's the last we see him of, of this episode. Everybody, even his father, thinks that he's dead as we go on through this storyline here in the Southlands, which will become Mordor by the end of the episode or renamed Mordor by the end of the episode. But he, I just am like, for for I guess for somebody who doesn't know mm-hmm. anything about what happened to set up the Lord of the Rings. Like you haven't watched the Peter Jackson films or what have you, then this can be a a great moment. And you can look at it from the character's perspective also as it being a great moment uh, just in terms of creating drama. But for most people who are very intimate with the Lord of the Rings, if they're watching this series at all, or I'd like to think that most of them are, uh this is just cannon fodder it's it seems like a waste of time does it not mm. oh I, I i don't think so why is that why 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 would it be a waste of time to see how mordor is becoming mordor what was oh before? no i don't think i'm not talking about that i'm just talking about the fact that uh everybody thinks that sildor is dead ah okay okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I think the whole Mordor thing's great. I, I think it's yeah. fantastic. But uh, th- the fact that we end this episode without seeing a Sildor. Uh, I think it's it, it's to add more of the family drama that we saw. Like, um, uh, technically, we don't know if uh, Ellen Gil had, any, uh, had a daughter. We just know about Isildur and Anarion. No? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know what happened to them. So they added this daughter to create uh, like some sort of reef in the family. And I think, um, like, since this episode is about being like questioning yourself, questioning your decisions, uh, this was the way to make a lens you question a little bit, uh, like, why he, why did he go to Middle Earth and, uh, what happened to his son? So that's why I think it's just a, like a sparkle of drama in this family, like to keep going for the second season. But obviously, Isudo is not that. Yeah. It appears like this. This series appears to really be like taking the the whole thing about if you haven't seen a body, then you cannot say it's dead. No. Yeah. Well, too, they did that with too, the dar at the end of this episode. They did that by the ladder. Yeah. By so uh, they had, yeah. It's uh, every just the whole list is like you got to wait till the end mm-hmm. of the episode to even find out that Bronwyn and Aaron Deer survive. No, so, and even like that, we have a name drop in this episode that you can uh, actually already say, no, I haven't seen a body. It's not that. So yeah, that's yeah. like. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, let's move on here uh, because I, I just I do want to say before we move on is this opening sequence with all of this was very dramatic. Um, I didn't have a problem with the way it looked. Um, and I thought, you know, the eye opening and all of that was great. The most disturbing scene for me was seeing the horse running through with the fire on its back. And I know that that's all CGI trick. Don't worry, PETA people. It was not real. Uh, at least I hope to God it wasn't real, 
but at any rate uh it was very effective for me that that really set the tone of of how much horror there is on the other hand i'm sitting there thinking god why did this person here survive and that person why is it so random you know mm-hmm. and, and you look at the buildings and they're all completely burning and 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 destroyed how did mm-hmm. anybody survive this uh and once again you have to rely on the whole jr tolkien fantasy trope to that some people survive and the important people survive the important people always survive uh so that's uh one of those things that i guess you just have to accept but it just i i think if you were looking at this as a realist you would just say you should say a pyroclastic flow is not forgiving to anybody uh no matter what you're hiding behind no matter what you're mm-hmm. dug in with uh so that always is a little bit of a cheat that, that television shows have to do if they're going to do something this ambi- ambitious. Yeah. Uh, but she runs, Galadriel does run across uh, uh, Theo and he's asking about his mother. And, and as she tries to lead him to safety, you know, Theo wants to fight the orcs who are now coming into the village and everything that, um, you know, Adar had uh, just made this land for. But uh, Galadriel says it's time to cut their losses. And that this is her fault. She blames herself. Um, and uh, as they continue um, through, on their journey to try and find uh, wherever it is that they are regrouping this Numenorean camp on a ridge somewhere, uh, Theo asks a whole bunch of silly questions, uh, questions mm-hmm. that she can't answer. And she uh, starts doing some a little bit of Middle Earth Confucius quoting in order to uh, help Theo. Uh, deal with it by speaking in in great confucius like uh, speeches metaphoric speeches and all kinds of things uh, but then she offers to train theo uh you know in the ways of the jedi i i, I mean as a soldier uh, which is fun mm-hmm. uh, meanwhile in another part alindil has survived uh, without any explanation and doesn't even look as beat up as the rest of them i guess the first thing yeah. he did was clean off his uniform uh, and he's watching for his son and the queen. He does find the queen and Valandil, uh, but Valandil uh, says he tries to tell the captain that Asildor has been killed because of the building, I guess. And mm-hmm. uh, he doesn't take that well, as <clears throat> no father would, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Then it turns out, as they continue to lead Muriel, uh, she was blinded by those sparks that went into her eyes when the roof fell, uh, but she hadn't been letting it on. Uh, and uh, that's where daddy's prophecy comes in that we talked about before. Later that night, uh, Theo is continuing to ask a whole bunch of questions that Galadriel shouldn't have to answer. But, you know, he's a kid. He's asking questions. So she answers them uh, and she speaks about uh, in terms of people that she's lost to the enemy. Uh, she, of course, her brother Finrod and then her husband, Celeborn. Uh, mm-hmm. who uh, I guess the way they're making it sound, he was killed in the War of Wrath. He was missed in action. <laughs> He's missing in action. Okay. Yeah, yeah she so- said that she haven't seen him since. So, okay. if you go by the rule that if you don't see a body, it's not bad. So, Caliborn is not bad. Oh, okay. See, I was wondering if it was his helmet that she was placing on top of the pile of helmets at the beginning in the prof in the uh, prologue. Ah, uh, maybe she thought it was. But yes, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Um, now, now, Celeborn is the one that we see in the Lord of the Rings, right? The yeah. Peter Jackson films mm-hmm. were in the books. So, um, once again, uh, a mystery there to unravel how Celeborn. Uh, may have survived but she believes that he okay so he's missing in action Uh, i felt bad for her during that little moment of guilt about the fact that you know when you when you 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 can't ever take advantage of the fact that you're ever going to see someone again uh because Mm -hmm. the last words that they hear are are you know are going to stick with you for the rest of your life more so than with them Mm -hmm. so uh that that was a little tough and um, then Theo tells her not to blame herself. Uh, that he blames himself for giving over the dagger that caused all of this, the hilt, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Galadriel cures it all with a little more Middle Earth Confucius speaking. 
But uh, I mean, I think I think Theo was in the right like mood. He should be blaming himself. <laughs> he shouldn't be. Well, here's the thing. This is like a <laughs> complete 380 for Theo, though. Look at it. He's taking responsibility for his actions. Can you imagine no. episode two, Theo? You, you mean that? 180, not 380. Like 380. Oh, so 180. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, he's doing, he's done a, what's a 180 plus a 360? Uh, 520. He's, yeah. he's doing a, or 540. Yeah, 540. He's doing he's done a 480 for 540 because he spun around to good and then spun back around to evil and spun around to good again. He's so, very confused. He's a teenager. He's very confused. He doesn't know what he thinks. And and he thinks he has a shot at Galadriel now that she's widow. She do, he doesn't understand how this works. Well, at, at any rate, he's landed the skateboard trick, and right now he's taking responsibility <laughs> for his actions. And uh, you know, uh it's still up to the fact that they get interrupted with this uh, because uh, or some orcs show up, so they have to be quiet, except Theo can't really be quiet. He wants to draw a sword, which draws the orcs over there, and all that orc can do is, is sniff ash. So not only do orcs evidently have super hearing, but they also have super smell. So uh, but it's so strong that he couldn't pick up the smell of an elf and a human uh, because the the scent of ash was so strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we go back to the Numenorian camp uh, where Beric, uh, the Sildor's horse, uh, won't listen to anyone because, yeah. uh, you know, Elin- and Elindel uh, surmises that it's because, you know, the Sildor is dead. So he lets Beric go. Uh, Beric goes running out into the wild. I don't wonder why Beric didn't go back to back to the place where Sildor is but maybe he goes, is going back to the place well maybe so maybe so maybe so he's I think off. yeah yeah you know horses are very like my favorite character in the Lord of the Rings trilogy is Shadow Facts mm. my favorite character Shadow Facts and Billy it's the pony okay like talking he wrote so well about the horses so it was it's so cute so i really like that the series is trying to do this too like yeah. it's very important to me and the, the whole is rohan such a culture cute. even is just an extraordinary exploration into yeah. people who take care of horses so uh i love that um but uh at the new Monorian camp uh at also uh elindil is regretting uh saving galadriel and halbrand from the raft uh because Mm -hmm. now he he thinks that that's all on her uh which is the same thing that she thinks that he wouldn't have lost his son at any rate come on like uh how can you be blamed by a volcano this is like they had won the war like the battle so it was the volcano who that made everything go boom. So I don't know. Right. But, but he I, wouldn't be it, there if it hadn't been for Galadriel. His son Asilda uh, would yeah, still be alive. True. Yeah, that's true. So that's why he blames her. Um maybe maybe he should blame Medio because Medio is the one who said, Yeah, let's go through with this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Well, at the end of the episode when Muriel says, you know, gives her a little pep talk uh at yeah. the end. Um He's sitting there. I don't quite know what to make of his reaction. If he's just grieving for his son, or if he's just <laughs> truly upset that she's doing this. I um, think she. Uh, I don't know. I yeah. think it's like at, at that point, it's like a mixture um, because the queen is lying that he, the thing like the their little vacation in Middle Earth didn't go so well, and he's son is dead and the other is in the west and like his daughter is like a crazy architect so i think he's like really reevaluating his life his whole life um, oh, he doesn't wow. have a wife too so he must be feeling like i'm i lost almost everything that's what I, that was my reading of it yeah okay well uh, you know, he's blaming Galadriel in his head. And uh, speaking of which, that's when Galadriel and Theo arrive just shortly after. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a uh, a long, dramatic search through the hospital uh, of Theo. Oh, yeah. the people who appear like they're going to be his mother and then they're not. And then you hear <laughs> Bronwyn's voice and uh, Bronwyn uh, 
says his name and he turns around and he hugs her, which is great. But I think the moment that got me uh, was the fact that Aaron Deer showed up and he hugged Aaron Deer too. He's like, oh, stepdad, thank goodness you made it. I it's love such a good that. family. Yeah, I love that family. Yeah, the great family, even though you think that Theo can still be a, 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 a thug um, or has the potential <laughs> to be a thug. Well, uh, thugs also have families, Matt. Yeah, Matt's people also have families, that's true. too. Us- usually thugs do thuggery <laughs> in, in order to help their families. So that's true. See? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, Galadriel uh, then uh, gets to Alindo and the Queen, and she does do the blaming herself. Uh, Muriel gives this very fist pumpable feet, uh, speech that, you know, is set up like she's going to be scolding Galadriel and it turns around, it turns it around to being, you know, this great, uh, win one for the Gipper speech about we're going to come back and we're going to win. Uh, yeah. the second half is ours, baby. <laughs> so, uh, I love that, that they did that. Uh, that was fantastic. A nice little version of the Numenorean theme in there as well as she does this. And, uh, they got to go back though and, and get some reinforcements. Um, and this is the point where I'm just kind of like, I don't understand what Alindel's reaction to this is. If it's just every, all of the emotion bubbling over in him. Mm-hmm. Or, or what it is, but I guess we can let our listeners tell us what they think about that. Uh, you can tweet to at Bust Blockbuster on Twitter. You can send emails to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com, M A T T S audio blog at gmail.com. Uh, then uh, Bronwyn and Aaron Deer uh, tell Galadriel that they will lead the village refugees to the mouth of the Anduin. We know this river very well uh, it, to a place that they call. Pelagir, I or I think that was what it was called. It was a port uh, mm-hmm. uh, for Gondor in the later stories that we know, mm-hmm. uh, and often being raided by the Corsairs. If you remember, if you haven't read the books, but you remember from Peter Jackson's extended editions of <laughs> extended. Uh, the Return of the King, uh, we saw lots of the Corsairs there um, at that time uh, who were attacking and everything. They were played all by. <laughs> which was really comical. They were played by, uh, I guess, what do you call those roles when it, it, it's a, a cameo roles all played mm-hmm. by like the, the people who did the production, Peter Jackson, was in there. <laughs> the guy that did the miniatures was in there. Uh, the, That's the, nice. the, 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 it was very funny. I, I enjoyed it. They, they turned it into a comical thing, but here it's not so much a comical thing because of course there's, Corsairs did do some damage to Pelagir, but this is where they're going. So we know that they're going to be part of Gondor now. <laughs> uh, a fresh start, as Aaron Deer calls it. No, Gondor doesn't exist. It doesn't exist yet, point. but yeah. but they, they're going to be part of the founding. Uh, well, it's already a Numenorean port, or that's yeah. what, that's what they're Bronwyn going to be says. vassals of Numenor, probably. Yeah, they're going colony, to be vassals, I suppose. Of, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Numenorean influence into Gondor is already starting to occur, even though we don't know it by that name yet. So uh, then it turns out that uh, Bronwyn says, Oh, by the way, Halbaran's alive. <laughs> This is the first time we see him in the episode because they had to make that dramatic too. Everybody was hoping that he was getting fried, evidently, if they hope that he is Sauron. I have no idea why people think he's going to be Sauron. I don't think he's going to be Sauron, but Galadriel is going to take him to an elvish hospital. Uh, I think and... he's going to be Sauron. Yes, I know you do. That's why I gave you trouble about it. I just gave you <laughs> trouble about it. Uh, he pledges to continue to fight with her. Himself. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, a crowd <laughs> gathers to wish them uh, uh, off and also to remind us that Halbrand is a king by all bowing and chanting and, and saying all these things. And then Galadriel makes a promise on making Theo a soldier. Hey, I'm not going to train you, but here's a sword. And uh, he holds that sword up very proudly as they as they run away. It's a good sword. It, it's a good He'll- sword. You know, he lost he lost the evil sword. Now he has a good sword. He has a so good sword. He's growing. I, yeah, I just maybe. wonder, you know, I guess Galadriel can probably just defend herself with that dagger of her brother's, but uh why give away a good sword to a kid? Uh, that you didn't train, by the way. You didn't train him a bit like you promised him you would. Galadriel to make, of empty to promises. Make him, to make him happy because he was sad 
about uh, being the cause of Mordor existence. Mm. So she gave him a gift that works all the time with like kids and teenagers. Yeah. Well, evidently it worked for him. It's like for him to get a new video game because he starts throwing it yeah. around all over the place. Uh, by the way, you know, the last time we saw Adar, <laughs> he had just kind of got himself as close to the ground as the pyroclastic flow was going to him uh, last episode. Of course, mm -hmm. he survived. He's so he, intelligent. He's, I, I, uh, yeah, Adar is very intelligent. I think he he was going through the, the tunnels, no? Maybe he just got like... Yeah, I don't know how not... much his chains would allow him to move any lower. Uh, but yeah. uh, the thing that shocked me was that Waldrig also survived this. Oh, wait a minute. Waldrig was up on the cliff. He was safe from the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, he was up on the tower with the with the uh, with the sword. He's itself. hilarious. He's the best. He's the best. Can you can you agree that? Like oh. Valdrick was hyping other to the orcs. I mean, if somebody doesn't need to be hyped to the orcs, he's the other. Yes. But he was like, "Hey, you are there. Hey, you are there. Because you know, it's an old man in the land that he helped destroy, hanging out with orcs. That's his life now. That's what he chose. <laughs> Instead of going to where Broly and all the people he lived his whole life were, like, were, he chose the orcs. He chose other. He chose evil. And he's, like, very happy about it. And he's, he is like... A, he is an orc cheerleader. There's no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, and he's hyping other. And other was like, no, no. It's not Softlands anymore. Exactly. But, Yes, it's amazing. Uh, and he doesn't actually say the name, uh, but you can tell that it's it's thinking. It's almost like one of those thought bubbles in a comic. Yeah, it's like, mm, what is uh, the so name? So we see the Southlands up there, and then we, whoop, Mordor it is. Um, and still no sign of a Sildor by the end of this storyline, uh, which is just uh. silly. just silly. I mean, uh, so what's the Sildor going to do? We have to have it in a finale where he comes out of nowhere. And uh, saves the day somehow, I suppose. Mm. Um, you know, and nobody even thought that he was still alive. It's the only way that it, that works. May, maybe Isidore is going to teach Theo how to fight with the sword. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Theo. Maybe Theo they are somebody. adopted. I was hoping that maybe Aaron Deer would take on the task before Sildor would, because Sildor, um, I can't even. I don't see to... I mean, what the heck? Yeah, <laughs> I don't G has to take care of Rowling. Yeah, okay. He doesn't have time for two anymore. Well, he's got time for a hug with Theo, so why not time yeah. for sword sparring? And he was he was showing him how to use a bow. Oh, but that's the thing. Aaron Deer knows how to use a bow. He doesn't really know how to use a sword. He's an elf. I think he knows how to, but um, he will have time. Uh, we just second season. Theo is going to be a sword master. It's okay. Yeah, let's move on to another group before we get into what's worse uh, for this. Let's 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 tackle the Harfoot problem. And uh, the Brandyfoot clan do catch up to the rest of the Harfoot tribe at the Grove. This wonderful Yay. magical place that reminded me a lot of Hobbiton, to be perfectly honest, with the hills and everything. But that's just me. I know that it's not going to be Hobbiton. I just know that it, it looked like it. Um, but evidently, uh, Mount Doom's a pretty vicious volcano. That's a double mm -hmm. D. And it uh, it spit a rock out that kind of did a lot of damage to the grove. And Sadak asks Nori to ask the stranger for a favor. Can he fix this? Uh, she stalls a little bit, but he decides to ask for himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, at it, it, it first it appears that... Uh, the stranger is doing some work here. He's speaking in, in little words um, that only trees can yeah. understand, according to Sadek. Uh, and, and there's some debate as to whether trees can talk or not. We know that they can. We even saw one of them in uh, in when the meteor first fell. We saw an ant uh -huh. holding its mother's hand uh, because, uh, because the meteor was scaring it. So, uh, But Sadek's completely right about that. Um, and uh, that's one the one case that he evidently doesn't know that Malva is right or is wrong about, because later on in the episode, he says she's always right about everything, uh, much like Priscilla is always right about everything. It doesn't so seem to work. So you're comparing me with Malva, the, the evil Harfoot. 
She's not evil. She's going on a journey by the end of this. She's a good. She's just a truthful. She's a truthful Harfoot, is what she is. I'm not Harfoot hitting here. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm 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 comparing you to the probably the best Harfoot in the whole clan. Uh, Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, he tries these little words and everything, and it doesn't really seem to work. A branch ends up breaking off of this tree uh, that he's trying to fix, and it uh, nearly crushes Dilly. Uh, is, that, is that her name? Dilly? I don't know. Uh, Nori ends up having to, to save the, the little one uh, by covering it up, and it, it actually just nearly misses both of them, thanks to a little fork in the tree, uh, in the tree branch. Uh, it just happened to go on either <laughs> side magically that happened uh so uh in a tolkien way um very much again but now everybody in the village is like oh this guy's maybe he's Evil. good maybe he does good things but uh there's always consequences as priscilla brought up to actions no matter how well intended they are uh so uh sadak says hey buddy i got you i got you a picture of the stars i'm going to tell you where some other big folk hang out Maybe they can help you. Oh, by the way, these stars haven't been seen for thousands of years. Uh, so good, <laughs> good luck. Uh, and uh, the stranger. I love Sadok. I love Sadok. <laughs> I, I, I'm loving the old man in this series. They have Valdrig and Sadok. And Sadok. They, uh, they are my heroes. They are, they are so wise in different ways. No? Valdrig in the evil way and Sadok in the, the good way. It's amazing. Yes, I agree. I I think that Sadek is a fantastic character. Uh, is that Lenny Henry? Is that who's playing that guy? Uh, yeah. I think he was a. This guy was a, a mainly a comedian on BBC television shows, and <laughs> he really he really captures those moments. He's got great chemistry <laughs> with everybody. I love it. Uh, yeah. At any rate, uh, you know, uh, Sadek says, hey, "Yeah, time to go, boy." and uh gives him the directions and the stranger starts to leave i feel terrible for the stranger in this moment he's just kind of like oh where am I gonna go now uh and he starts to leave and he sees the breaths of the brandy foots they're watching him go uh i can't tell if they're just scared of him or if they're just respectfully saying goodbye uh, uh -huh. but here's the thing nori has got just a big heart just like uh, Largo says later, she's got such a big heart um, that she doesn't want him to starve on his way to the next place since they're kicking him out. So she gives him one of the few apples left uh, there and uh, and hands it to him. And it's a very nice version of the stranger theme, which I talked about in my musical uh, analysis earlier, in case you skipped over it. A wonderful version of it. Very touching moment. And uh, then you know nori realizes she's like all the trouble that this is all caused and it's all because i brought this stranger along i went to that meteor site and everything mm -hmm. another moving moment for me which was just a glimpse you wouldn't expect this kind of thing to hit you but it's the fact that she calls her stepmother goldie mom for the first mm -hmm. time in this series it just really got me i thought that was really cute and, and yeah. cool and uh you know the, nori uh has kind of awakened goldie to the fact that you know the whole stay on the trail nobody left behind thing <laughs> is uh is one of those things it might just be poppycock speaking of poppies uh poppy goes to get water uh and, oh and, yeah and uh she actually wakes nori first to tell her that the stranger spell did work they go outside and everything's fixed it's all magically fixed all the trees are growing. Everything's going good. All of this just full of apples. There's all kinds of crops in the grounds and everything like that, which nobody planted. But for some reason, they're there. And it, it's wonderful. So she says, OK, I'll go get some water. When she mm -hmm. goes to get the water, she finds a footprint. Oh, big one. A very big footprint that she does not like. And I guess she goes back and reports to the rest of the clan. Uh, but we follow the pail, the bucket that she left behind. Very irresponsible of Poppy to get rid of water buckets. I mean, what happens if that's the last one left? Well, look what you did. Uh, the evil trio that we saw earlier investigating the meteor is at the other end. Uh, what is the deal with these? this leader of theirs having black hands all of the time? I mean, it's like the, 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 the palm of their hand is completely dark. I don't know. She's evil. 
Yeah, well, well, she's got, she certainly doesn't know how to wash her hands, which makes her, well, you know, in my book. You know, like, as Halbrand said, like, appearances can be deceiving. So I was holding hope that they were actually not evil, that they were just trying to, like, return the wallet that the stranger left uh, behind when he was, like, going with Naughty and Poppy. You know, that he, they just wanted to return, like, a, a missed object or something. I don't know. They just wanted to say hello, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Give them but a tip or two was, about what's going on down here in Middle Earth. Yeah. Yeah, but, it like, because they were, uh, you know, they don't say anything. They just look evil. So you're, like, you're kind of in doubt what is going on. Maybe it's just, like, a red herring. And no, it turns out, no, they yeah, very people are evil. bad. These people are really, really bad. <laughs> it was, it was so stupid because, like, uh, the reaction that that she has is completely disproportional to the thing that Lago told her. Like, Lago was just trying to defend her, like his daughter, and then was like the woman just decided, no, I'm going to set everything on fire now because you spoke to me. It's amazing. Love it. Yeah, don't try to stand up to me. She's very evil. Uh and, <laughs> and she was like just and, and Nora <laughs> even tries to give her friendly direction, saying, Hey, it went that way. Although I think she was pointing in the opposite direction. I think she, she was, was pointing to... the opposite direction and like the the people, like the good people in white, they knew, obviously. And then Lago comes to say, Don't you dare do this to my daughter, blah 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 with fire. And she's just like, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm going to set fire in all your possessions just because you spoke to me. Yep. You should not. It was amazing. I love it. Now, I'm going to say this on record right now, uh, mm. because after all of this happens, uh, uh, and, and Nori tells them all of that, and then they <laughs> burn down their whole encampment um, just for saying hello. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, the 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 idea is is that these people are obviously going to go off and, and try and chase the stranger down. Here's going to be the shocker. This is my prediction mm. for next episode. What we're going to find is that we find at the end of this episode <laughs> that it, everybody half the half of the half of the clan is going off trail uh, to go help the stranger <laughs> to warn him about these these mm. people. Who really didn't do anything much, you know? You just took the fire <laughs> out, uh, put the fire out of of Largo's hand, and and ends up, you know, just blowing on it, and somehow that just happened. Yeah, everything else just happened to spontaneously combust. But here's what's going to happen. Yeah. Here's what's going to happen with that trio. Our little Harfoots are going to be racing after them, trying to warn the stranger. They're going to get there too late, and these people are mm. going to show up and say uh, to the stranger and they're going to try to warn and warn and warn. And these people are going to show up to the stranger and say, Oh, Hey, Sauron, <laughs> we really appreciate uh, the fact that we are uh, big fans. We are know, big fans that we've had to chase you all over the country, but we will serve you. You evil, evil stranger <laughs> who is Sauron. That is exactly what is going to happen. Uh, and Nori and Poppy and Sadak, and Malva and Goldie are all going to be so shocked and then they're going to be killed. And that'll be the end of the Harfoot story uh, to get rid of all of the haters this season. Harfoot haters. Yep. Uh, <laughs> the stranger so. is going to say that little girl over there made me do things I didn't want to do. Um, she, and she, she gave got me in my way all the time when I was trying to heal myself from things that I didn't want to do. Let's kill yeah. her now. That's what's going to happen. No. No, no. Okay. I think the the harfoots are here to stay. Well, as long as we're going to argue like this, maybe we should just go ahead and move on to our what's worse questions. Yes. What's worse? This is where we play it like high school debate team, which Priscilla has never done, but somehow still manages to win every week anyway. Uh, this is where we ask a question that has two sides. The person who is asked the question gets to pick the side they want first. And then the person mm -hmm. who asked the question has to 
reply in the opposite it has to argue the other side and then we look put it on the poll and let you folks decide once again at bus blockbuster on twitter who wants to read a question first do you want to or um, you want me to i will read the one first because it's like uh it's smaller than the second so okay you go ahead so what's worse the guilt of feeling like you failed everyone in the fight against evil or an annoying kid traveling companion that asks too many questions. So I get to choose between these two. Yes. Uh, how can I make this funny? I guess I will say an annoying kid traveling companion who asks too many questions. Why? Because, you know, first of all, it doesn't matter how guilty you feel or anything. There's nothing worse than the feeling of wanting to kill, kill a kid because he's asking about your personal life. He's trying to get to know you better. He's, he's, he's obviously the source of a great deal of evil. And I mean, I mean, what can be more annoying than trying to answer questions that can't be answered where you have to mm -hmm. rely on your middle earth Confucius in order to just to satisfy the kid. And he can't even keep quiet when orcs are around. I mean, this uh -huh. is awful. This kid just needs to shut up and find his own way back to Numenorean camp. Uh, that's what I say. That's why uh, Galadriel's situation with Theo is worse. Now, uh, how are you going to tell us that the f guilt of feeling like you failed everyone in the fight against evil is worse than that, Priscilla? Well, you know, the future of Middle-earth is at stake. And you are the only one. You are the only one who sees the threat for what the threat is. And you are the only one who is doing something to fight it. And you go and you fight it to save me the earth from evil. But then you fail. So um, I think this, like, the stakes are so high here that you cannot really compare this to traveling with an annoying kid come on we are talking about the destiny the fate of middle earth and an annoying kid you just ignore the annoying kid you just give the annoying kid some video game to play uh maybe a cookie uh you know you just tell him that he's right that you're there for them but what, what can you tell me the earth when you fail me the earth what can you tell? Oh, sorry, Midor. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe next time. No, it's worse. He's already letting him carry the sword. I mean, what more does the kid want? Why does he have to be so annoying? <laughs> the kid. He's a teenager. Uh, yeah. We will put that on the poll, ladies and gentlemen, at Bust Blockbuster on Twitter. Please uh, respond to the polls. Leave us your comments as to how stupid my argument was or uh, how wonderful Priscilla's argument was as you vote for her. <laughs> Let's do one more question for this round. Uh, and this one pertains to the Hobbit. Yeah. Pardon me, Harfoot story. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that looks like Hobbiton. Uh, what's worse, causing your whole community to go up in flames because you brought a stranger to town and an evil trio followed him to you? Or having to travel to warn the stranger about what's happened and having companions like Malva and Sadak. <laughs> well, I have to say that, like, um, you know, causing your whole community to go in flames is the worst of those two. And oh. I tell you why. Uh, I tell you why. Um, you know, you you already you you are a member of this community. You're not really uh, known for being that helpful to begin with. No, uh, you know you know like uh, as this slightly uh, idealistic kid who is always trying to do something better, something different, and people they don't have much patience with you to begin with. You know. But they they think, okay, this kid uh, yeah, has a good heart, whatever, is going to learn with time. And then, like, the first opportunity you have to show them that you actually, you're growing up, that you're taking more responsibilities, you bring this guy, like, you just met. You just met this guy uh, that fell from the sky, 
and you you have to bring this guy to this community and you don't know much about this guy this guy uh is kind uh, he doesn't even speak your language so it's already like another hurdle in this community no mm. uh not only you uh but also this guy and in the end what happens is that this guy is being followed by evil people and the guy goes who away who are actually but- his friends let's face it they're they're actually and- his friends the guy goes away, but the evil people go to you to ask you about the guy because the guy was last seen with you. And uh, then the evil people, by like, you know, just because they are evil, they set fire on your feet. On your feet. So, yeah, this is like you, you try to help and how you get paid by losing everything. So mm. I think this is terrible. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty good argument, but you're completely wrong, and here's why. Nothing is worse than going on a great adventure where you're going to save someone <laughs> again and having it be riddled down and bogged down by uh, some a, an old couple who think that they know everything <laughs> and insist on taking the lead and happen to always be right most of the time. Yeah, to always be right most of the time. I don't know how that sentence works. At any rate, uh, Malva and Sadak are the absolute worst. Can you imagine all of the griping and arguing? And and then eventually Malva will be right because Sadak says she's always right. And turns out that Malva can be wrong. We heard Malva be wrong in this very episode. If you were paying attention to my recap, she was wrong about uh, certain things. So uh sadak even believing that she's right about everything means that sadak doesn't know anything either and these two people are going to be the people who dis- insist on taking the lead as you walk off uh to try and save this guy who is really just trying to meet up with friends his friends are just trying to meet up with him anyway it's all a bad situation it's the worst kind of hell that anybody can go through when they're doing a traveling experience is to have you know, you go on one of those bus tours where everybody goes and sees all of the sites. And there's always this one couple that insists that they know more about the place than the tour, than the tour guide um, and, and start to ask silly questions and start to hold up the whole tour. And by the time it's done, all you've gotten is a glass of orange cola all day long. And uh, it's now eight o'clock when the tour was supposed to be over at five o'clock. It's all. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and all because all because of Malva and Sadak uh, in character form in, in your in your touring uh, group. So that is why uh, traveling with Malva and Sadak is worse. We will. Put you that were on... very eloquent. I felt as if you leave this through yourself. I have right. to say, I may have some personal experience <laughs> in this matter. At any rate, <laughs> we will put it on the poll. Uh, for you to decide, ladies and gentlemen, and again, leave comments telling me why I'm wrong, why Priscilla is right, as you vote completely for Priscilla at Bus Blockbuster on Twitter. We've got one more storyline to cover here. Casa Doom. Casa Doom. Uh, and uh, this one is had some really great moments in it and some really awful moments in it. That <laughs> yeah. uh, so we start off with Elrond negotiating with King Durin about the Mithril. By the way, all of the other Dwarf Lords think that this is pretty good stuff, uh, but they don't know that Elrond can overhear or understand stone language. So uh-huh. uh, they're, they're commenting, and, and he's just kind of like, yeah, you're right. Uh, or, or, no, I don't tell lies. Uh, so anyway, he's got a 500-year plan, Elrond does. Uh, you talk about a, a, you know, a new deal. Uh, like a Roosevelt New Deal. This is this is the ultimate New Deal, and uh, Doran doesn't. Uh, King Doran does not trust elves, but Elrond reassures him. Hey, you don't have to trust elves. I'm a half elf. Yeah, trust the half of me that's not elf. <laughs> Which or, I don't know. Or, or, or trust me, just half. Yeah, or trust me. At least meet me halfway. Exactly. <laughs> So, uh, Daddy Durin, that's a double D, he tells Son Durin that it's time to just let the elves die. Everything has a, <laughs> has a time in life, and, uh, the, you know, this is something that evidently the creators have willed, 
And yeah. uh, because you don't you don't go messing with that. Also, he adds that, you know, digging more mithril that deep might cause a whole mountain to collapse on them, which that to me is a pretty compelling reason right there. Uh, yeah. an even more compelling reason waiting down there at the end of the episode. But we'll talk about that in a second. When Disa hears the news that uh, King Durin has decided not to help the elves, she is not happy. She is hammering hot metal. Uh, there's a double H in there somewhere. And she tells Durin as much, uh, even says that the king has lice in his beard. Um, turns out that his, her own mother does. Oh, no, wait, Durin is joking. Um, but uh, he then has to, Durin then has to tell Elrond the bad news. And it was a really heartbreaking scene. Very done, done very well with Elrond's theme, which I talked about in the musical uh, analysis, but uh, where Elrond actually says, hey, buddy, it's okay. It's not your fault. Uh, and he says, Nama Namarie, I think is how they said that. Um, Perfect, Matt. And they said, uh, which basically means not only farewell, because you don't say goodbye when you're an elf, because elves live forever. Well, not so much anymore. But elves, uh, uh, you know, when you say, when you say goodbye. <laughs> not so much anymore. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so they just say farewell. Uh, and, and also it means go towards goodness, uh, which is a wonderful little saying. And uh, as Elrond is leaving, uh, Joran throws the mithril down in disgust that he couldn't help his friend. And it lands right next to a leaf that came from the tree of Linden conveniently, the one that uh, Elrond had been using as exhibit A. See, we need help. And it didn't really, you know, what happens is, is the mithril completely restores the mm -hmm. leaf. That causes Duran to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something here. There's actually something here to what Elrond is saying. So let's help him out. Let's defy daddy's oh, uh, demands. That's that's a triple D. Uh, and uh, go ahead and start mining. So uh, Durin is going to try to clear the way for more mithril. That's a double M. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Elrond uh, ends up trying to give him a little bit of drink because they have to pause for a tremor or whatever. And uh, there's a discussion about dwarf ethics and everything, which leads to Elrond admitting that he threw the rock splitting contest just so that he could get more time with Durin and uh. walk him into his thing. Uh, because they find that comical, which I did too. I love that. Uh, Durin is about to reveal his secret name to uh, uh, Elrond. I guess he considers him a brother because you normally only, only family know those things like wives fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. Uh, but right before they do, Elrond says, no, hold the phone because we're not sure we have the rights to be able to say this. Hold the phone. Uh, we'll talk about it once we get to the other side, which they never get a chance to do because as soon as they do break through to the mithril, which is wonderful, I loved how the camera shot uh, started out panning in on Doran as he's peering through the hole and then panned out as Elrond is also looking through the hole. Uh, and you see the, the extent of the mithril, a lot of mithril down there, more mithril, more mithril. That's a double M it's the mithril mother lo mother load. That's another double M. Uh, but, uh, unfortunately as they get there, uh, it seems like daddy Duran, the double D has shown up. Oh. And he, uh, he, knew he uh, kicks Elrond out, says, get out of Casa doom, buddy. And, uh, Elrond is thrown out and he sits at a rock and, and, and cries. Cries. And then uh, Daddy Duran disowns Duran. That's a quadruple D. Uh, he says, you're no longer going to be Prince. You're no longer my heir. I'm taking this collar off of you, which indicates as much. Leave it. You don't deserve it. Um, later on, uh, Disa blames Daddy and gives Duran her own personal win, win one for the Gipper speech. You're going to be king anyway. Uh, we're going to do this thing. Uh, you're going to see. They're going to kill Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to defeat Daddy. That's a double D. I don't know how they're going to defeat him, but somehow they're going to figure uh, out how to a, get back into coup. the king. They're planning a coup, perhaps. A coup, no. yes, absolutely. Meanwhile, yeah. King Durin uh, throws Elrond's leaf into the mithril vein, uh, the hole, uh, and orders that the place be sealed up. He wants to destroy all of the evidence. Um, however, 
<laughs> we didn't realize how well he would be destroying that leaf because we follow the leaf floating down and 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 down deep within the mithril vein i mean way down within the mithril vein and at the bottom all of a sudden the leaf combusts because of the balrog's bad breath uh we see yes. our balrog uh which was uh, uh -huh. a lovely sight we hadn't seen the balrog since it's a stylized version in the story uh that was mm -hmm. before so uh, uh i have to say something like okay. people are like ah oh, this is so cheesy this is so terrible like some people's reactions about the leaf being healed by mitriu and then like uh that during just like picking up the leaf and throwing away um but i think the whole point of this is just it's just like to to show how how hateful that Iduri can be to the elves because like he realizes what the leaf now what causes the leaf to 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 be healed he knows it's mithril he knows now that indeed there was a problem and they could solve this problem for the elves but then he's just like yeah nah, no thank you very much no goodbye then he just throw the leaf away, like the leaf that, you know, it's like, yeah, no, so, sorry, elves. And like pretends that nothing happened, nothing to see here. No, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's just to show how evil Daddy Doreen has become, like in his old age, like Jesus did say. But and he's right. I mean, he is right, but that's the thing, man. Sometimes bad people can be right too. Mm -hmm. It's not only good people that has, you know, good reasons. No, sometimes bad people do that. And in this case, Daddy Doreen, he just doesn't want to help the elves. That's all. But uh, he has a point because there is a Balrog, a Balrog there. He and is. I doubt that he knows that the, the, the Balrog is there. He just, no, but uh, his vision yeah. is telling him that he knows that something bad will Nothing, happen to his yeah. entire race. It, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, you know, like what I think they're doing is because in the the ring that is made of Mithril, the uh, Nenia, the... Um, the one that Galadriel has, he, it has like some preservation and uh, protection against evil mm -hmm. properties. So maybe they are just extrapolating this. It's like Mithril has like the, the metal is the one uh, that has these properties that are imbued in this ring. So that's like, that's what they are going for uh, too, yeah. I think. Uh, but like it's a very roundabout way. Let's be honest. Now it's kind of yeah. like, eh. and the whole thing with the Simarillo. Like nobody knows. It's a legend, but it's a very weird legend. Well, what I find most appalling about the whole sequence is the fact that the leaf didn't get hung up on a single cliff ledge before it got all the way down there. I mean, it had to be going through tunnels halfway sideways and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't tell me that a Balrog causes that much in the way of air current to keep a leaf afloat like that. So it's totally unfeasible, totally unrecognizable. I think that it is just a travesty that they would even try to do such a sequence like that. I'm yeah. Uh, it didn't matter to me one way or the other. I just was happy <laughs> to see the Balrog at the end. Uh, yeah. Balrogs so, are people too. Yeah, I, I don't understand why people get so nitpicky about that stuff. Anything uh, else about this particular part of the storyline? Or I'll tell you what, before we get into what's going on. Oh, I have to say something. I think uh, Elrond has never been so cute. He's very cute. He's looking episode. very cute. He's looking yeah. very un-Ned Stark these days. Um, he's looking oh. more, much more like an elf. He played the young yeah. Ned Stark in Game of Thrones. I know, right? but he looked like... <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta bleep that. Uh, we can't say that on the double I'm P. Sorry, yeah, he looks that's... like uh, so... there. Oh. Yeah. yeah. All <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Uh, Elrond does look good. Any other thoughts about this particular storyline? Um, I don't know if they are in the relationship as you suggested, but if they are, they are in this together, and I I wish them well. Elrond. Elrenisa. <laughs> Elrenisa. Um, Elrenisa. Yes. Uh, yeah. Elrenisa. They are amazing. 
we've come up with the shipper name of El Renisa. We love this trio. Um, yeah. Just as long as they don't have sex together, then we'll all be good. Uh, hey, can, you cannot say the other, but you can say sex. I don't know. This podcast has strange rules. You can say sex. Uh, sex is an accepted uh, by the FCC, whereas uh, okay. some other words are not. Uh, okay. So it, it's all a matter of whether the FCC accepts the rules or not. Let's talk about some of the bigger headline topics uh, before we get into our what's worse questions here. Yes. Because we do have a, 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 a little wheel of topics. It only has a couple of things on it, so it should be pretty easy to read. But let's spin the wheel. Somehow that wheel is so small, I cannot read what it says. Uh, what Which topic did it land on, Priscilla? Uh, so will episode eight answer the questions we have? What questions think, do you have? You know, like, I think in the preliminary podcast, we were talking about how they would pace, how, how they would do, like, and we were wondering if they would keep the mystery of who was Sauron for too long. And in my opinion, my personal opinion, I would have liked that they had revealed this uh, around uh, episode five or even episode six, but to the audience, not necessarily to the characters, they could have revealed to to us mm. who Sauron was. And then you would have like a couple of episodes like screaming at the, the TV, he's Sauron, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked that, uh, but I read like uh, some quotes uh, with the showrunners, and they said that they don't see the last episode as uh, an episode as like connecting dots and setting up for the next season, like some other uh, series would see. Like they are conceiving uh, the first season as something uh, an end in itself. So mm. they are seeing this last episode as the last episode of this part of the ep the, the story, basically. So uh, if they're saying that to me, so they are telling me that they are going to answer all the questions. They are going to answer who Sauron is. Uh, they are going to answer exactly how Mithril is the... Uh, uh, going to save the elves if they are going to ask if the situation uh, answer if the situations with the elves are that dire no because elves they they would be diminished but not like by spring now this was it's uh, anyway so something is a fool there and like I honestly like it's one hour one hour and ten it's a lot to go like answering there is also the thing with the stranger. So technically, they should also answer for us uh, to us who the stranger is, which I doubt it. Because Two birds, one stone. He... The stranger yeah. is Sauron. That's all they got to do. But the stranger might be Gandalf. No? And they... My guess is that the stranger is Gandalf, but they're not going to say it's Gandalf. They're going to just say, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's no. the one who likes hobbits. I told you my prediction. The three, The three evil people. Uh, the Hobbit, the Harfoots are going to witness the three evil people, and you think that uh -huh. they're going to kill the stranger, and they're just going to go up and go, "Hey, master, how are you doing? We're happy to be here." Uh, the showrunners are going to tell you uh, whatever they want to tell you. They're going to say they're going to say things in interviews like, "Yes, we will give you all the answers," but they won't say the answers to whose questions. Mm -hmm. They don't care about your questions, Priscilla. They're going to say, oh, we pose these questions in our season. I know it's offensive, isn't it? But they don't. They only say, well, we <laughs> we, <laughs> and we asked questions ourselves about what we had written so far. And we answered mm -hmm. them in this episode. We know that you don't care about any of those questions that we asked, but we answered them. Uh, it's the it's the Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse technique of answering questions from Lost. Oh my god. Let's hope it's not going to be like Lost. <laughs> oh, I thought the ending to Lost was beautiful. It answered all my questions that I, I didn't know I, that I had. I, I didn't watch Lost. I just know that people did not react very positively about it. Very, Lots of people were very upset, and I don't understand why. I love the ending of Lost. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So th- we have another topic. Yes, let's spin the wheel again. It landed in the only place that it could land uh, because we blacked out the other one. Uh, this one is uh, the mystery over Sauron's identity is hurting the show or keeping things more exciting. I quite frankly could care less. I already know who Sauron is. I know it's the stranger. You no, already you know who know. Sauron is. You know no. it's Halbrand. So I, I, I don't know. My... I don't know. I like I already said it. I think it it's dragging for too long in my opinion. Yeah. But I'm I'm like a very intelligent person and I know that the average viewer is not as amazing as I am, so maybe they are excited about it. I don't know. <laughs> I think you are amazing and I I accept that answer. I'm sorry. But sorry. No, 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 you are. Uh so <laughs> what I think is that uh They've gone now an episode longer than the Wheel of Time did. Oh, uh, yes. Revealing the Dragon Reborn. Mm-hmm. So I think this was just about holding a record. Oh, you went seven episodes? <laughs> going We're going to gonna eight. go eight. eight. Hey, we may even go into season two. We may go ten. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. Matt. Yeah, I think it's all about I think I think it's all about penis measuring. I think is exactly what it's about. But can you say penis, but you cannot say the other word? I don't understand this. <laughs> I mean, the way that the FCC does, in fact, uh, manage what words you can say and can't say is worse than just about anything. But in that spirit, let's ask some what's worse questions. Yes. What's worse? Okay, what's worse? Losing your country to a bunch of orcs and an old man addicted to evil? Or being drafted as a child soldier by a very good looking but already married elf lady. I was wondering the whole time about this situation. I think being drafted as a child soldier is already terrible, but being drafted as a child soldier by like a very beautiful elf lady you have a crush might might take the cake. No, like you know that the lady is married, but you want to impress the lady by being a soldier. Uh, and she promised to teach you the ways of being a soldier, but she just did, like, uh, just to make you happy. She just she didn't mean it. So you are in a situation that you, you cannot win. You're already a child soldier. You're already committed to that idea of being a, a soldier that young. And uh, you are not impressing anybody who you want to impress. And the promise is not going to be kept. So she's going to end up leaving you at some point. So it's a, like uh, it's a situation where there everybody wins but you. It is hard to say no to a hot elf. Yes, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I know. Elves are not real, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, uh, I got to argue the other side. Yeah. Uh, your father being a stubborn old goat. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, lo- no. Losing your country your to a country. bunch of orcs and an old man addicted to evil. I mean, God, it's just terrible. I Now, this, this, this old man, this Waldrig fella, who is absolutely going to become a Nazgul. Imagine Waldrig as a Nazgul. That has to be worse. Waldrig is going to be a Nazgul because uh, he's already proclaiming Adar, the king of the Southlands. He is going to be the king of the the Southlands, formerly known as (laughs) Southlands, now known as Mordor. He is going to be, (laughs) he's going to be the Nazgul that stabs Frodo with the with the Morgul mm. blade, uh, and there's nothing worse than thinking of that 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 creep, mm. ugly, mm. awful dude is going to get to do more evil for the rest of mm. time. That's mm-hmm. my argument. I don't think it's a very good argument. I think that you actually probably won that argument because <laughs> you know elves are hot, and what can you do about it? Nonetheless. <laughs> Okay. I, I think that uh, I, I think that you probably want it, but we will put it on a poll anyway at Bus Blockbuster on 
Twitter at bus blockbuster on Twitter is where you will find the polls. Uh, there's still one question mm-hmm. left here. I believe it's your turn to ask. What's worse, your father being a stubborn old goat who won't help your friend in his whole race, or the fact that he's actually right not to want to dig there because Balrogs are bad? I think it's worse to have to acknowledge the fact that your father is an absolute jerk. I mean, he's a poop, and there's nothing you can do about that uh, because he's actually right. He knows that the future has told him, you dig that Mm -hmm. far down, it's the end of all of us. We've seen the end of all of that in the Lord of the Rings. But he didn't say that. What happened to that? He didn't say that. He just said no. No, let let things play out. That's what he said. the, The primary reason of a leader of a whole race of people Mm. is to ensure the preservation of that race. (laughs) If he does not, Uh if he does not say no, he's essentially dooming his own race so that some tall guys can rule the world. Come on (laughs) guys that don't even know how to live underground. They sit up there with their flowers and their trees and whatever. No way. Elves are hot, but they're awful. I don't want their leaves all over my place. I don't want to give them anything that'll just keep them out there while I'm facing a Balrog down beneath or some kind of evil that I know was coming. If I dig too deep, because I have that crown on that tells me that I will, I tells me that, you know, I see my son with a beard, even though he's about to die of pneumonia. Uh, I see him with a beard. Uh, The vision that I had from the crown that tells me all of the things in the future uh, tells me that he will live and he will be a gray haired king, um, which I have now thrown out the window because I have no choice uh, because otherwise this gray haired man will have ended up destroying my whole race of people mm-hmm. because a Balrog is down there. He is right. And it's worse to have to realize that when you're the son, that's okay. the problem. I what think I think the worst part is not that he's right. I think uh, his right is a mitigation a mitigation factor. Mm. No. So your father be a stubborn old goat. It's not only about this specific situation. So if he's a stubborn old goat, he's uh, always like that. It's not only about your friend. It's also about what we are going to eat for dinner. It has to be what he wants. It's about uh, where we are going to uh, go on vacation. It has to be where he wants to. So this is like this is this is a pattern of behavior that your father is engaging in that way. So, um, yeah, he's being a terrible person in front of your friend, but he's being a terrible person in front of everybody else. So this mm, this is worse because. It's not about being rational. It's not about being a king. It's not about uh, wanting the best for your people. It's just about being a jerk. It's just like, yeah, I will say no because I can't. It's an excellent argument. Uh, I have no counter at this point. So we will put it on the poll and let you people decide. Remember, be sure to comment when you see these polls at Bus Blockbuster on Twitter. We want to hear your replies. We want to be able to read them on the podcast. We absolutely love hearing from our listeners and we will continue to spout your thoughts uh, because uh, who cares what we think? Well, we care. Yeah. That's the difference. Uh, you know, Bubba and and Catfish will say, who cares what we think? We want to know what you think. The truth of the matter is, is yes, we want to know what you think, but we personally care what we think. We're not going to say anything as brash as to say that, you know, what we say doesn't matter to us. We know it doesn't but matter it, anything to you, but we, we know it, that... It, it, it would be strange to say I I don't think in like what I say matters, right? Like, well, it would be very I mean, strange. Exactly. Thing. I mean, you have to. Why say <laughs> anything at all if it doesn't matter? You know? Yeah, you just keep watching. Don't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll put those on a poll. We do have results from last week, which neither Priscilla or I argued very enthusiastically because she was not feeling well. I was having camera issues. All kinds of things were going on. Uh, yeah, and as you know, Matt, he's just half mad if there's no cameras on him. He's like, he, he he likes cameras. He lives for this. 
I, exactly. Uh, I am I am completely <laughs> self-absorbed in the way that I have to be on camera all of the time, um, except when I'm coughing today. So, uh, coughing hyster. Uh, just awfully uh, actually but mm -hmm. what's worse admitting your addiction to an evil object to a, a soon-to-be stepdad or finding out that that <laughs> object has been switched out right underneath both yours and his noses uh wow. seamlessly swapping out one uh by a two to one margin 66.7 percent mm -hmm. it's almost like four out of six mm -hmm. uh voted for seamlessly swapped out uh what's worse double peeing that's pitchforking poop for an entire boat trip or finding out that your dad knows all the elvish things when he's been busting you down for thinking about the western shores hmm interesting well dad holding out uh won 57.1 percent to 42.9 percent and finally what's worse everyone asking about your former boss meaning uh for adar i guess it's uh asking about sauron or mm -hmm. remembering or trying to remember what you did to the guy who's now about to kill you and asks you how. Uh, the boss bragging won by a wide margin, 71.4% wow. to 28.6%. Evidently, everybody hates it when the bosses brag or when people talk about your boss. Uh, I'm the same way. When people talk gloriously about Bubba, uh, it's just like saying that I don't matter. And I, it really helps. It really hurts my self worth. The guy who has to be on camera all of the time, one hundred percent of the time. It's me, yeah. me, me. So don't talk about my boss, Bubba. That's a double B. Talk about me. Talk about me, Matt. That's a double M. All right. <laughs> we had some feedback, also. <laughs> Unless you have any comments about our what's worse. Nope. No. All right. No. Uh, on YouTube, we did get uh, during our episode five review, we did get a comment from Null Test Channel, Null Test Channel, uh, who is a faithful watcher of Double P Media videos. We appreciate uh, your subscription and uh, for even paying attention to our videos, even though we know that you're there mainly for Bubba and Catfish. Uh, but Null Test Channel, Null Test Channel did chime in saying, I think the Rings of Power is incredible. So do we. Oh, yeah, we like it too. We like it very much. Yeah. Uh, on the other flip side of that coin, on Twitter, uh, our friend W. Axel Foley, who is from the DVR Podcast Network, he's the founder of that network. He took over Podcast Winterfell for me when I left. And uh, he is uh, not big on The Lord of the Rings. But for mm -hmm. last week's episode, he did say, well, I'm happy to report that The Lord of the Rings, the TV show, was actually kind of good this week. I think it's still not great, but at least the pieces are coming together so we can finally get a quest, which is how this show should have started. I don't think mm -hmm. we're going to get a quest. I think we're going to continue to get in uh, separated stories all the way up till uh, season two. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't see these storylines. I don't see how the Harfoot story is going to come come into alignment with any of the other stories so mm -hmm. uh he continued to say i'm actually enjoying the busting blockbusters podcast more than the show your enthusiasm helps i guess i'm just going to keep on watching it until i love it because i love lord of the rings no you don't have to love it um don't mm -hmm. you know uh i think one of the big issues for axel is um you know he he's a cinematographer a director He's worked in film before, and I think some of the colorization of of some of the stuff is a little bit too uh, off for him, because to me, I think there's a realism to like the world, the Tolkien world. To me, mm -hmm. when I see that, it's a Tolkien world and it works beautifully. I think that that's beautifully visu visually beautiful. But I think to somebody who Axel, who's worked with film and and how things can feel dirty or whatever uh with colorization or not uh, i think to him it seems just a little bit too much fantasy oriented i would argue that that's what it's supposed to be but if you're not into that kind of flavor of color palette i could see how that could bother you um but that's that's mm -hmm. i think that that's probably axel's main complaint about the show uh he has some story point issues as well but i i will uh often just glance gloss over those i suppose uh simply mm -hmm. because 
I I just love the the whole thing about being in the world of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, so I I will sometimes ignore those and try to be more positive. Anyway, Axel, we thank you for listening to the podcast uh, very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, <laughs> Axel. We want you to send yeah. in thoughts as well. Uh, by tweeting to at bus blockbuster on Twitter, you can send emails to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com, M A T T S audio blog at gmail.com. You can leave comments at my website, Matt's audio blog.com, M A T T S audio blog.com, or you can leave comments on the double P media YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash C slash. And you can, and you can all, uh, say to me if my obsession with Valdrick is warranted because I want to find other people who feel the same. So please, if you feel the same about Waldrick that I feel, tell Matt. Well, you heard it. I don't endorse that statement. Uh, <laughs> YouTube.com slash C slash the word double, the letter P, <laughs> the word media. Uh, you can also find our bosses and tweet to them about how we talk badly about our bosses here. Uh, simply oh, do you think? At the word double, the letters PHQ. You can go to Facebook.com and leave comments there facebook.com slash the word double letters phq or you can go to their website to find all of their great podcasts they're covering andor right mm -hmm. now with their parsec passion podcast they're covering house of the dragon with their joffrey podcast subscribe to them all remember mm -hmm. you can't do a willful hateful unsubscribe until you first subscribe so subscribe to these <laughs> channels right now uh these podcasts right now so that later when they make you mad you can unsubscribe angrily uh but the only way that you can show your hatred of unsubscribing is if you first subscribe so do it now mm -hmm. uh that's all that we've got for this particular episode before we leave though priscilla do you already have your review for lord of the rings season one episode seven out the eye i have and it it's there on uh, my channel. And tomorrow I will be uh, discussing with my friend uh, Carlos at Universo 42. Uh, I also did like another participation in another channel, Manda Azorian. Um, and I just want to, I'm sorry, Matt, that I uh, interrupted you, but I had to talk about Valdrick. I cannot think about anything else. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, it's a Waldrig warble uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's a double W. Um, do you think is there, is, there is any chance that he is going to get his own spin-off? What? I don't want to see the journey <laughs> of a guy who's going to become a new, uh, a Nazgul. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want him to, to become one of the witch kings. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but it would make for a great double W, you know, Waldrig, witch king. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And I never said anything bad about our boss. Okay, you should not imply that again. But oh, yeah. you're right. You didn't. You did not imply it. I imply it all the time. Yeah, you imply that he's true. rich, which is a little personal. I imply that they are rich. I don't know. You know I've seen your comments on YouTube. <laughs> no, Baba Catfish, uh, you are amazing bosses. Like, um, yeah. We 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 like what you're doing, like you helping us, you extending your fame, trying to to get uh, us to be as famous as you are. So thank you for all your efforts. That's right, Bob and Catfish. Just keep <laughs> standing on our sturdy backs to climb to success. <laughs> yeah. See you later. <laughs> See you. Part of Double P Media, doublepmedia.com.